So hi, Swanee. Good morning. And hi, How are Darius. You? Good morning. Good morning. We're, today we're talking about your new book titled Publish Your Photography Book. And this book is a collaboration, the third edition on the topic of publishing your own uh, photo book. There has even been a French edition of this photo book in the past. And yet, yes, and it, yet it all started as a column, right, Swanee? Correct. 20 years ago, it's our 20th anniversary of collaborating together on writing about photo books. Darius had the opportunity to begin a magazine, actually, at PhotoEye. So, so, I'm sorry, Darius? No, I was just going to say I was the ed at the time I was the editor of a quarterly journal called the Photo Eye Book List, and nice. um, and I reached out to Swan to say, hey, do you want to co-author a column with me about the nuts and bolts of publishing? Because all every photographer I run into asks, how do I get a book published? Even though at the time I was just a bookseller, I was not a book publisher. Oh, yes, and so we sat down at a conference. I don't even know what year this was, but it's been a, it's been a while. And we we outlined what we thought would be a really interesting series of columns about about talking with first editors and how do you even conceive of a book and then what is it like to work with a designer. And as we outlined the column that had not yet been written, we said to each other, "This sounds like an outline for a book." So anyway, so we then went ahead and wrote the column. It ran for three years, basically, because the the journal was quarterly. So we sort of got into this and we did lots of interviews with publishers and talked with photographers. And um, and then in 2007, the last issue of the magazine came out and then we switched into um, reaching out to publishers to say, we think this is a book. and. Our first choice was Princeton Architectural Press, and they very happily said yes before we'd written the book. And then we spent the next well, that was a year and half yeah. final, finalizing it, really. Yes. Yeah, what, what really changed, Raphael, for us from the column to the book, two critical things were happening in the industry. One was print on demand was knocking on our door. And the opportunity for photographers to self-publish was real. And the second thing was the collectible photo book was also becoming very real. And Dale Kaplan, who at the time was the head of Swan Agency, Swan Photographs, and she wrote about the coming of the collectible in contemporary books. So it was a very exciting time in photography for us to place that book. And it's thrilling to be at our third edition. I bet. And um, why did you decide to coalesce? So why, Darius, why did you recruit, recruit Swan? Is it because of the amount of work involved or is it because you each come to this place, each come to this from an entirely different place and that yeah. and diversity that it would bring? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, S Swan and I have different, uh, well, first of all, Swan had like, decades of experience working with photographers and yes. um and her her agency swan stock was was legendary and she did a lot for photographers sort of breaking into more and more commercial fields um and then had been in, involved in lots of education and coaching and collaboration with others and working on marketing and guiding photographers through having successful careers and at the at the time Remember, I was editor of this quarterly journal that was all about photography books, and I thought Swan was a great person to to collaborate with. So we we definitely have overlapping, obviously overlapping areas of interest, but also divergent sort of careers and things that we've been involved with. So it, it feels like a really great collaboration for me. I hope I think Swan feels the same. <laughs> but the energies also have to coalesce, right? The energies have to work together. Yeah. There's something else though that I want to add to that is that Darius and I both studied with an amazing photo historian named Bill Jay. Um, we both attended Arizona State University at different times, undergrad and grad, and um, he, he gave us this incredible uh, kind of foundation 
for the history of photography, the history of invention, the history of science, the history of culture. And that's how he taught um, photography. And it was a fantastic uh, formation of ideas for us from that point forward. Yeah, we certainly yeah, they, yeah. from yeah, Bill J. A. Substratum, a common substratum of knowledge about the subject. Absolutely. Matter. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's others in the field that studied with Bill as well. Chris Pickler, Krista Elric, all, many interesting people have that. Uh, we had the great pleasure of studying with Bill. You yeah. band together sometimes? Bill, you know, so Bill passed, Bill actually passed away. What, well, gosh, what year was that now? 2000? 11 or 12. He had, he, I think it may have been one of the last times we saw him together, Darius, was when he received the um, Infinity Award from ICP for yeah. his life achievement in writing. Yeah. And, you know, so there's, there's, Mary Virginia lives in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. Arizona State is up in Tempe in Phoenix. And really there's, if you, I mean, this is kind of nerdy photo history, but there's definitely a Southwest, what I would call a Southwest school of photography in the sense that there was a, there's a handful of professors, Bill Jay's one of them, William Jenkins, Mark Klett, um, and then over at UNM in Albuquerque, which is right next door, as far as states go, you had Beaumont Newhall teaching for a long time, oh, right. Van Deren Coke. There was really a, a almost like a, yeah, like a school of philosophy around the history of photography and a kind of shared camaraderie in that sense. And, um, and of course, then in Tucson, you have the, the Center for Creative Photography, which is one of the great archival um, institutions for photography anywhere in North America. So there's a lot of synergies that happen in the in those Southwest desert states down there. You're speaking of a certain esprit de corps. Exactly, for sure. Yes. Um, so please. So it's been 10 years since um, your last edition, I think, am I correct? Ten years um, certainly since our research ended. It's uh, on the calendar. It actually falls at nine, but we had to finish the research the last time for production. So, ten years. In, in the interim, uh, the the photo book has evolved, and has become a, a genre mm -hmm. in and of itself with a huge range of forms, textures, sizes, and structures. Really, and we've seen the evolution of the book structure. Uh, over time. And in passing, Darius, uh, I want to mention the wonderful series of photo book presentations you did on Instagram mm. with the pandemic. And we all want to thank you for that. That's right. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And <clears throat> so in your book, you discuss the photo book as an art object entirely conceived and executed by the artist, you discuss photo fairs and you discuss alternative views and processes. Did you decide at the outset that your book was going to be different from anything else that's out there on the shelf? And how was it, how was it going to do that? Yeah, this is a great question. So. 12, 15 years ago when we were writing the column and that was coming out and thinking about the first edition, there, there honestly, there were no books about photography books, about publishing photography books. So in a way, we really sort of laid that initial foundation. And we, the, we always thought of the audience, it was the same audience that we had for the column, which were photographers who were interested in publishing a book and didn't understand the publishing world or were not book designers themselves. So it was very, it was meant to be very kind of basic in that sense. And not, it's not a, it's not a resource guide in the sense of you're gonna open it up and find lists of publishers and lists of printers and phone numbers and things like that. You can, the internet provides all of that. You can look those things up, but we really wanted to initially address some of the conceptual uh, questions that really lie at the heart of photographers who are out there making images and working on long-term projects 
And then in, in the distance, they have the idea that there's a book on the horizon, but they don't know how to get from where I am here. I've got a pile of photographs and I know there's a book. And so the first couple of chapters, and this is one of the things that we've greatly expanded in the third edition, is this initial conversation, which was actually very meant to be self-reflective. Where am I in my career? What is this project really about? Is it, is it a project that has large sort of mass public appeal, like a book about a book about dogs or a book about Iceland? Or is it a book that is, is it much more of an artistic manifesto about me as an artist? You know, and, and then thinking about, then once you start asking those questions, you then very quickly start to wrap in, well, what is the form of this thing that I'm thinking about? Is it large? Is it small? How much money am I going to have to raise? Is it, is it very DIY or is it a very sort of slick commercial production? We sort of really try to get photographers to think about that and be honest with themselves to conceive of what this book is going to be so that then they know how to make the next steps and choices. So it did call uh, on a lot of self-reflection and a lot of thinking about what really that book was really about and whether it had a place in the world. Whether it had a place in the world. And we think that, I mean, you can see the bookshelf behind me. There's plenty of books out in the world and room for more. Um, but initially, and this is one of the things that has changed so much over the last 10 years, the ability to produce yourself or with a single designer, the object that you really desire. There are so many tools out there. And this question very early comes on, which is, should I, and it's kind of like a fork in the road. And this is where we spend the first two, three chapters talking about that. The fork in the road is, should I seek out a publisher who will handle all of that for me? Or do I really just wanna go and kind of make it myself use all of these tools, find the right designer, self-publish, use social media to market it, go to the fairs myself. You know, it's kind of like to be published or to self-publish. And that's, Swanee has some thoughts on that too, I know. Yeah, and I, I, you have to, you know, I have this kind of mantra in my classes that says, don't rush to the monograph. Yes. It's like, don't just throw everything out there when you really haven't had your hands on the material or lived with it long enough or really challenged to all the areas raised. You know, let your let the project breathe. Look at lots and lots of books. Think about if you have developed a collectible marketplace for your work. Because if you have, then there's the possibility of adding a limited edition or some kind of a deluxe or special or library edition to it. And all of those things should be considered on the front end before you dive in. So we really work hard in this particular issue to, to expand on the, the reality that people are self-publishing, right down to helping them better understand paper and printing and binding. I mean, not to be mistaken as a how-to, because it's not ever intended to be a how-to book. It's more about what is possible. Yeah, And that's part of why there's so many other voices. There's so many roundtables in this new edition, roundtables of, of editors, of designers, of booksellers, of the people who are involved in fairs and, and awards, uh, right down to collectors, how to place your work in uh, special collections and such. So there's a we assume that at this point in the evolution of our book, our audience is growing, but they're choosing to self-publish. So you reached for additional contributors to bring into the conversation, which Definitely. is quite interesting, uh, really. And I want to ask you, how did you decide on which contributors to tap for this project? Were there criteria, internal benchmarks, certain concerns to be addressed? Any contributor names you care to uh, share with us? Yeah, happy to. You know, the from the beginning, including in the first in both of the first and second edition, as well as this one, the book is filled with roughly half of the content is our voice, sort of walking you through these these different stages of, you know, and just to kind of 
cover this loosely. There's a, the, the initial chapter is very much just about the whole photo book phenomenon of the last 20 years. Yes. And then, and then as I, as I said, there's this, the second and third chapter are really all about you as a photographer and your, and thinking about your audience and what it is that you want to do. But so half of the book is that, and then we get into the making of the book, um, the marketing of the book, the selling of the book, case studies. So all through these stages, we we pulled in what we call industry industry voices, um, and these there are roundtable conversations, as Swanee said. With um, initially, we actually have the first one that we have is is filled with uh, curators and other figures in the field. So Clement Cheru, Ann Wilkes Tucker. Chris McCall, who's the director of uh, Pier 24, Natalie Hirschdorfer, who's a curator and a writer, like just a range of people that are, are seen as tastemakers who have, we know, rely on the book. You know, one of the great things that Clement said um, that we used as a quote in the book, he said, I want to be crystal, I'm, I'm paraphrasing at the moment, but he says, I want to be crystal clear that by far the most useful tool for learning about new photographers as a curator has been the photo book. So far more than industry visits, okay. far more than go, you know, studio visits, going to galleries, it's been learning through the photo book. And we thought that was a great sort of starting point to kind of set the stage around um, just how useful, uh, useful and how prevalent and how able to get into the nooks and crannies of our lives the photo book is. David Campany is another figure in there who's a great, um, he's a fantastic writer and curator and thinker around photography. So that was the first sort of round table. And then we get into very practical, we wanted, you know, it's one thing for us to say, oh, this is what it's like to work with a designer or this is what an editor does. But to actually hear editors say, this is how I approach a book. This is how I would like to work. And there, there are sometimes conflicting information or rather divergent views some editors like to work this way and another editor likes to work the opposite way and we thought that's important to hear for photographers so there is no formula there's there are principles around publishing that's what the text that swanee and i share is all about the principles and then you hear the very specific um directives and approaches that these different people take you know and we all know different designers are radically different um, yes. that's what makes the books interesting so there were uh, there are a lot of voices and from all these voices uh we the artists will pick one or identify with one of them and um, right and proceed accordingly. yes yes yeah. uh, and so you you obviously knew the demographics of your readership, and you steered the whole conversation, the whole photo, the whole book, in that direction. You no. knew you knew ahead of time who was going to read that book, because and, you had and, to read the Yes, true. But we also wanted people to to really understand where traditional publishing is today as well, so that there's no mistakes for them to understand. The difference between publishing and self-publishing. So, for example, there's a deep essay from a literary agent, Joan Brookbank. There's a piece by one of my favorite university press people, the executive editor of uh, University of Chicago Press, Alan Thomas, speaks about the reality of working and the differences and similars of working with yeah. the university press and kind of demystifies that notion of the peer review, which I think steers a lot of photographers away from a university press, when in fact, if, if their work has a subject, especially something that's studied broadly in academics, a university press could be the perfect place. So mm. we try to help people understand that. And to the same point, when we get to editors, there are different voices of editors that have their own section to expand upon, like the late Joan Lifton, who really stresses getting the work out of the computer and working on the floor, on the tabletops, everywhere, and beginning to sequence with, with real in real time with real objects. Um, Joshua Chuang, who goes into the, the development of a project from an archive perspective with Santu Mofokeng, and then um, at Aperture, Denise Wolf talked about the evolution of the new project Girl Girl Pictures. My, that's the correct yep. title, right? Justine Curlin's book. 
book. So each section has deep voices by some of the people in that in that section, that topic, which I think adds quite a bit. So your book is in some way systematic and, and it provides a lot of information on the subject and it proposes a lot of voices and points of view. Um, so this book is will probably become one of the must read books for anyone who wanted to publish their own books. Uh, but and I'd like to ask you a simple question: What is a photo book? It's an experience. <laughs> what what determines? Uh, what determines that this book is a photo book as, a, as opposed to not, as opposed to an album of images? Um, well, exhibition for the wall. Yes. What, what here, I'll, here, here I'll, read, I'll read you the best synopsis. It's from John Gossage. Are you okay. ready? Yes. Firstly, it, meaning the photo book, should contain great work. Secondly, it should make that work function as a concise world within the book itself. Thirdly, it should have a design that complements what is being dealt with. And finally, it should deal with content that sustains an ongoing interest. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's what makes a great photo book. You asked what is a photo book. There's lots of bad ones out there, but that's what makes a great one. Mm -hmm. it's um Yes, I'm sorry, Swana, you want to say something? I wanted to point out that we cover traditional publishing, the limited edition through to the handmade, because we feel like people are choosing very different vessels, if you will, to place their work in. One of the case studies, one of the seven individual artists that we discuss their practice in depth as it comes to bookmaking is Dianita Singh for whom the book is the work. She's long been a strong proponent of the book being the work, not the prints from it, not and discourages people from even thinking about making a special edition where you sell a print for X number of dollars more than you sell the book. She feels that the book is the work. Yes. And um, does the book touch on major themes uh, for anyone of thinking about uh, producing their own book or going the publisher route, like um, uh, photo selection, uh, sequencing, the power of narrative cohesiveness. Uh, those are often subjects that challenge the artist. Mm -hmm. We don't dive deep into um how to it's not a book about how to edit a great photo book it's really more about like once you are working on the book how to get it published what are the routes to take so yes. in that sense of the in that sense of um i would say like the deeper nuances around what how to make a perfect sequence in a photo book we're not advising around that it's it's allowing in a way where we stay focused on what is the what are the principles around publishing so it's really it's it's mostly about publishing rather than how to make a great photo book it's really about how to how to publish how to how to understand the publishing industry just to yeah, be clear so in yeah. terms of there's not a chapter on how to edit how to edit and sequence your work we're we're leaving the aspect of the creativity of the artist is an assumption that um, already there it's already yeah. there like we're it's also not a book about how to go out and make great photographs that will then right. become a great photo book yeah. you've there's an aspect of you've got you've got some of that has to be dealt with separately right. so uh, in, i'm sorry go ahead if i may there the things that we had mentioned the editorial voices the design voices and the production voices do fall under something in chapter five called making your book and I think the importance of us to expand on that in this edition is that there's so many publishers now that are small presses whose editions are 300, 500, that 
we felt it was important that the photographers choosing small presses also understand all of those elements, even though they may have someone doing those things with them, collaborating and such, whether you hire a designer and are still taking that design to a publisher, just that those core elements are really important. The production piece of that, we do remind people about the match print and thinking about you know what you're delivering it's not a how-to again, but it's the voice of Mike Lundgren, a, a master printer who creates these files for um, noted photo book makers, yeah. as we know. And also we talk more here with people, the kind of, we we update an interview, if you will, from 10 years ago with the, the team at Conveyor. There's more, a, a production house that can choose any of a number of printing processes of binding types of um, cover, foil stamping, die cut, all of those pieces are there and they can help you visualize what you want. So we are mindful of people that are being published also, or shall I say, we're encouraging them to also really understand the production possibilities. Yes, it's a maze for someone who doesn't know, it really is. And how is um, publish your photography book organized? Is it easy to navigate and find topics? Yeah, absolutely. It's very organized. So like I said, we, we spend the first three chapters um, sort of talking about the photo book phenomenon of the last 20 years um, and then really bringing the, the photographer to a point of asking this question about um, the fork in the road, which is, should I seek out a publisher and what are the reasons behind that? Or should I work to self-publish and what are the reasons that you might choose to go down that path? What are the, what are the business ramifications to both of those um, paths? And then it goes very, very quickly into, um, into, into the logistics around it. And I'm just looking here at our table yeah. of content, um, I, you know, the first, the first four chapters really deal with that being published. What does it mean to be self-published? And then making your book, working with editors, um, working with a designer, working with the production team. That's the making of it. Then you get into the marketing and selling of it. And how do you get it into the collections that you want it to be? How do you find the audience? Um, that's chapter six. And then we have case studies. So it's it really takes you through the whole process from having a pile of photographs to, uh, to box. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I have to say, we try to help everyone with the decisions that are gonna be common to whether you're being published or self-published, which has to do with agreements. You know, whether it's learning all the aspects and the typical language included in a traditional trade contract, right down to all the agreements you would want to have in place with the freelancers or the small press components, all the production people, that if you're building your team, all it's of those- very complex, things, yes, that's very really complex. complex. And there's, a, there's a very dense um, marketing strategy section as well, all the different pieces from the very beginnings of making sure that you have your brand in place, your URL, your Instagram name, et cetera, all the way through to extending the life of your title through traveling exhibitions if your work is in fact suited for the wall it may not be the case for everyone but those plans we all know how long it takes to get on the docket for an exhibition at a proper venue so we we really push that out and um the section that darius had gotten up to the marketing and selling then leads into the case studies where these seven photographers help us understand bookmaking in their practice then the resource section is really deep for people to understand there's a timeline of the typical production process a one-year timeline and then the marketing timeline starts before publishing and extends after because of the the life of the title so it's deep very deep yeah, because you know if we go if we decide to go the publisher route as opposed to self-publishing most aspects of uh publishing are shouldered by the publisher. Self-publishing, on the other hand, is can be very exciting, uh, super tricky uh, if you don't you haven't done it before and all consuming. Um, yes, and, and we do help people understand that if you are self-publishing, 
to consider possible sponsors? Is there a subject of your work that there's an association or there's grants specifically to, for furthering awareness of that topic? Is there a corporation whose mission uh, matches yours that they might fund it and be interested in buying at pre-publication uh, enough volumes of that title to bring your unit costs down? We help people understand that piece of self-publishing as well. Yeah, and and it, and um, it um, shows that if you decide to self-publish, there are helpers along the way that can help you navigate all these difficulties, and that's that's yes. what your book does. Yeah. A lot of in, yeah. In fact, I have to say, at the end of this, the process of making this, two things continue to help them beyond the the life of our title in a way. One is that. The section of our book in the last two editions that were resources, that, like Darius mentioned, publishers, uh, book fairs, competitions, awards. Um, now we've added like production houses, all these kinds of people that could be a part of your journey to your book. We've moved them to a website that is being built as we speak that will also include the artist book world. So it's the limited, it's the traditional publishing limited edition to artist books in, I mean, I can't even tell you how many pages deep it's gonna be of resources that are live links. That's gonna be phenomenal. And then the other thing, which you may have noticed in the PDF that we had sent you, there is a standalone workbook. I interviewed right. photographers. Yeah, I want, I felt like, we both did, absolutely. People were rushing, people were not stopping and doing that deep contemplative work about why do you want a book? What's your subject? Let's hammer this out. Who's gonna be your audience? How's it gonna come together? What publishers do you love and why? Why is this book important to you? What do you feel is gonna be best for you? And right down to which papers and printing and binding are you interested in and what are your test results from those just like really pushing people to, to go the full step what what we did was we interviewed photographers and asked to see their notebooks from their first book and all of these different pieces that came into play there were underscored by our talking to artists who in fact they made this section on their collaborators that if they hadn't, it might've gotten confusing for them. And so we took that and we added, what was the task that they're doing? What's the fee? When do they expect to deliver? And what's the, when are you expected to pay them? So our workbook is really going to be a tool that will go far beyond um, the, the, what they'll learn in the pages. It's like putting everything in the book to work for you and your project to make the best of it. So the artist needs to become a, a project manager, really. Whether you're being published or self-publishing, I yes, feel. Either way. But yeah. most importantly, um, your book tells self-publishers that they need to know they need not walk alone. Am I correct that there's always someone out there and there's a resource there? Absolutely. Are. Yeah. yeah, and that's Absolutely. a very reassuring thing for someone who hasn't done it before. Yeah, your book it's, does that. I I would extend that to say that the book encourages that because I think most of us know that artists aren't necessarily the best editors of their work, aren't necessarily the best designers of their work. So seeking professional help in those departments is it's comforting and it also makes for better books. Yes, absolutely. Um, let um, the people who know what they're doing do their part. Exactly. And I think a lot of artists share with us that they speak with different designers. They might yes. parse out the project and get the, the voice of many different designers. Um, one of our essays in the book is about the first book. And we invited Colleen Mullins from the Rolls and Tubes Collective to talk about the, how their collective made the decision to do a book and then what were their steps collectively how did they think about finding a designer well of course they talked to photographers who did they work with who did they love so in in uh in the interview the designer chimes in baba foldish comes into the discussion about choosing a client giving them advice to be efficient and how to make that partnership work really well yeah, I have to say that the choice of a designer is uh, key 
um, because the designer gives voice to the artist's intent. Uh, he's the interpreter of the artist's intent and brings it out in the open, real life. So the choice of, a, of an art director is absolutely key and that's a very important decision. And I know that you also um, discussed distribution because uh, what's the point of having 300 gorgeous photo books stacked neatly under your bed? Am I correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. And one of the things that we, we walk people through in the workbook is reminding them who should be receiving complimentary copies? Who has shown your work in the past? Who have, who's acquired your work in the past? As well as who are the dream people that you really want to work with one day that you want to send a copy to as a intentional kind of um, strategic, shall we say, gift, but not to just randomly get those copies going out. I feel like, I feel like so many people that are making small, runs of their first books are using them really wisely. They're getting the exposure from it that they deserve, but also they're really being careful about who make who they make sure has it and knows about it before they're sold out. I don't know many, many books now in the small runs that don't sell out quite quickly. The network that of talking online in um in the internet and and Twitter and the works, uh, we're all hearing about good books. And they sell out quickly. So um, I think that's a great thing for the photographer if they're prepared for that. So they've covered their bases to make sure they've held on to some copies to get them placed in MoMA's library, significant collections, and uh, make sure the legacy is there to build on. Yes, it's important to have your book in a museum's library. Absolutely. We interviewed John Evans, who's the head of libraries and archives at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And his collection, having had Ann Tucker as the chief curator for over 30 years, has rich relationships with artists to the extent that they have the maquette for the American, for the lines of my hand. And recently, as John refers to it, they've acquired the complete maquette history to date of the Mexican photographer Alejandra Cartagena. They are very interested in the role of the maquette in one's bookmaking practice. And so they are in fact, both coming to our class together to talk about the collection, the practice of the maquette and why that was a strategic acquisition. So let's talk about brass stacks. Let's talk about money. Considering the prices paid for art at institutions like Christie's, a place you well know, Darius. Yes. Can photographers conclude there is a bright financial future for them in photo books? <clears throat> they want to become rich and famous. So we, we actually dive right into discussing financial aspects and how Publishing a book, an illustrated book, whether it's a commercial project or a, a labor of love and a small run artist type book, it is not the same as publishing that we mostly read about in the press. We don't read many stories about illustrated books. We read about this author and that author and somebody won you know, this prize and there was a, a book published and it sold 50,000 copies and you know, Harry and Meghan have sold 2 million copies and it's blah, blah, blah. That is not illustrated book publishing that is that is manufacturing text ink on paper that manufactures for maybe 50 cents per per object that is then sold for 24.95 in the airport lounge right illustrated book publishing is is nothing at all like that and should be seen as a way to further your career not as a way to make money most photographers and honestly, most illustrated book publishers do not turn a profit, which is why great places like Aperture or Radius Books are nonprofits because there's no profit in publishing. Mm -hmm. That's literally why they're set up that way. So the, the, the way to think about a book is really about in the context of your larger career. So when Swanee talks about the fact that small run books are being used 
by the photographers very judiciously and sent to the this curator and that fair and this contest it's because they're not they don't care that they're giving away a book the book itself is a tool to let somebody know about you as an artist and hoping to gain broader recognition within the 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 art and photography community and that's really the way you have to think about it going into this and i'm going to use an example about how we track success and failure just a, an analogy which is if you publish if you print 200 copies of something and you go into it knowing this is going to cost me eight to twelve thousand dollars and i'm going to do this and i'm going to send it to these people and i've got this list and i'm going to go to this fair and and you sell out 200 copies in two months do you feel like a success absolutely but that's partly because you recognized the breadth of your audience at this point in your career now if you had said you know i really need i need to publish two thousand copies and you did exactly the same thing except now you spent maybe thirty to forty thousand dollars and you went and it and those and you got 400 copies sold out all right not not sold out but you sold 400 copies in the exact same amount of time now do you feel like a success or do you feel like a failure you would feel like a total failure though if you were the person who had decided to sell 200 and then and then you realize you could have sold 400 you might have felt like a success right so it's all about recognizing like first don't bite off more than you can chew and it's far better to sell out of something and then think about the next stage rather than make way too many and overextend yourself and misread your potential audience and then be stuck with 1600 copies rather than selling out the 200 i mean it's you, you see what i'm getting at it's like yes. this is part of what we talk about yes. in the very beginning about being realistic about who knows you if 500 people follow you on instagram not all 500 are going to buy a copy if 50,000 people follow you on instagram there may be 500 people that buy a copy but even then maybe not i mean you know what i mean it's sort of like you have to really think about all of these aspects and just go into it in like in really digestible, you know, take digestible bites and 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 be, you know, be be as realistic as possible, I guess is what I'm saying, knowing that you're not it's not about making money. It's about advancing your career. Ultimately, you're referring to educated understanding of what it's all about. <clears throat> Absolutely. And that's again, that's the goal of the book is to help you understand the whole process and what tools are out there and then send you off out into the world to go and attempt to make great books. I mean, we want you to feel fully um, as educated about the process and who might be able to help you and what are the channels for doing this as successfully as possible. But, but it's not about like, this is how you make a great sequence. You can, you can f find out that that's a different book, <laughs> but um, you know, yeah. in French it is said that education is what's left after you've forgotten everything yes yeah so yeah. Uh, what's left of course is a new mindset and opening and a vastly expanded view of the world of, or of any particular topic we are no longer lost the light has been shed uh, turned on in in the room and i feel that Absolutely. a lot of what your book does is that because it has demystified the topic of publishing books. Right. You know, I feel there's a sense of urgency here because I see so many average books. And I know that the photographers have spent a fortune on them. Most often it's their first book. Someone came to them and said, we'd love this work. We'd be happy to do it. So there was really no searching around for other people. They go with that publisher. The pub publisher might not have strong distribution, so there are boxes and boxes in a garage. And I've at a recent photo fest, Raphael, at, at breakfast where all the reviewers are seated, breakfast and lunch together, I always ask questions of my colleagues. And I said to my table of curators one day, are a lot of you getting books in the mail? And they just hung their head and said, 
oh my gosh, we're getting so many books. And the saddest thing is that we know how much they're spending on these, but we don't have the space. They won't fall into our research files. Whereas if they'd sent a small thing, a little card, something about it, or a, a leave behind that tells us the project is there, then, and again, not rushing to the monograph, going more slowly into it, beginning to build awareness of the project, then when, when a substantial, whether it's a small book or a big book, but a, a consequential uh, book of that work comes, they can embrace it. So we have a mission to get this book into the hands of the photo book classes around the world. We really get it into the people's hands that are making books because we really feel it's going to make, it's going to change bookmaking. We're going to see better books from people that are reading this thoroughly before they dive in and rush to the monograph. And there is a, then there is a companion um, workshop. And yes. that, there is, tell us why some participants seem to find this workshop so special. Apparently, even experienced artists awaken to possibilities and resources they never even suspected just from attending the workshop, which is on the same topic as your book. Can you yes. tell us something about that? Sure. So we developed this. It's a nine week course. And it's partly it's partly just to to recognize that different people learn different ways. Right. So some people will sit and read the book and absorb it and use the workbook without having any guidance and are happy to do that. Other people learn through conversation. So it's really about we've broken the we've broken the book down into essentially four sort of what we're calling core lectures and then and then each core lecture on one week is then followed by industry voices that we've invited in and we'll have conversations with on the topic at hand so we kind of move you through essentially what's the outline of the book but through work in workshop form in this in this course that uh that's on Zoom and is open to everyone. Um, and you can, it's being hosted by an amazing organization called La Luz, L-A-L-U-Z um, workshops. And they're they're hosting us and we came to them with this proposal for, for this nine week course. And so they're the ones organizing it and you can visit their, their website and, um, and find out all the details. It starts on April 29th and it runs basically through July 1st. Almost every every Saturday, there's there's one or two that are missed in there. Um, I think just one actually, right, Swan? Day weekend in the United States, we don't yeah. have a class. And, just yeah. Memorial Day weekend. Where can you but, buy the book, and how can you subscribe to the workshop? So the go ahead, Swan. Do you want to? The, the the book is in pre order at our publisher, RadiusBooks.org, and um, shipping we hope is in June. It was printed. I think last week, I haven't had the update on seeing the, the fold and gathers the F and Gs, but um, we're hoping for shipping in June. The class, as Jerry said, begins the 29th of April this month. That's and, very and soon. Yeah, very, very soon. soon. July 1st. But the important thing is we leave all of the conversations in class, everything, the chat, the links that we create from every week's conversation, from every guest, etc. Darius is producing a series of video interviews with photographers, editors, etc. about the bookmaking process that will be in-depth, one a week will be added. All of that content remains live for unlimited access really? by all the participants until October 1st. And I've learned that over time that there's so much content people really yes. wish to revisit and revisit and revisit. So that it'll be up for three months afterwards. And at that point in the fall, Darius and I will begin doing what we're calling small group photo book reviews, where we're hosting 12 photographers in one five hour session where everyone has a chance to share their project status with us, whether it's just an idea or you've got a maquette to show in a list of proposed publishers. Those participants will also receive a video of their meeting with us. And the great thing to me is that all the other photographers get to listen to all of those conversations. So there's so much learning that happens in that third component, the small group photo book reviews next fall. Plenty of months will have passed, so we hope that people will have consumed that information and are really ready to bring their project to us. So <clears throat> you've put in a mountain of work uh, since uh, the first edition 
and a lot of thinking. And this uh, third edition is a very serious update. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you get out of uh, all this work? And what lets you know that you reach your target? And how important is that to you and why? Well, I think that uh, I'm, I'm going to speak for Swanee and myself here and say, I think we're both natural born educators. We, I love sharing information. I'm a total uh, cheerleader around photography. I love to just share what I've learned um, about the whole industry. And Swanee has been a very successful educator for, for many, many years doing lots of courses and lectures and workshops and guided tours and all sorts of things. So I think I that's one really... of them. I took one of her workshops actually. And I'm sure you learned from it. She's yeah, always a, a fountain of information. Yeah. So I think that's really like at the core of it, it's about wanting to wanting to share and wanting to encourage people to um to if they want to make a book, there are ways to do that. Swanee, you want to add anything? The only thing I would add to that is what when we will be happy is when we are seeing better books coming out that the, the numbers of that's average, motivation that's that to me is the marker you know if we jump ahead to the to the book fairs and to the competitions five years from now i really think our books can make a difference so one last question to you both as you know there is an exhibit at gagosian's bookstore of new prints by Bennett Miller. He was the director of the film Capote. And these images were produced using uh, the Dolly E image generator. In other words, they are fine art photographic images created by artificial intelligence. Do you feel there's a possibility to include this new technology in your upcoming books and workshops? I would say I would adjust what you said. I would say that they weren't they are they are fine art photographs, which anything can be fine art. It's whatever we call fine art that were produced by a human using an AI tool. Yes, they were not produced. Just AI doesn't just produce its own thing. It gets directed by humans. Yeah. But you can you can that's a that's a separate two hour long conversation. Sure, sure. But can of course obviously photo books can be made out of these images. Sure. Sure. It's a They're, it's a form of creative expression. The artist is that, making that. Is that a new venue like NFTs, uh, an expanded uh, way to produce art that will be covered and um Will it we'll have to that? we'll have to see. We'll have to wait for the fourth edition. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was leading to. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, we're all eager to see the fourth edition then. Thank you. Thank you. Raphael, thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you very much. Both of you. Thank, yes, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful to chat. Thank you. Same here. Look forward to speaking soon. Yes. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>